Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. We're so glad to have you here. Um, I am Sharon, the Director of Client Success at CE Zoom, and I have a couple house housekeeping items to go over um, before we start, if you haven't done this before, but I'll also put the instructions in the chat. Um, and I'm going to give you guys a quick heads up how to get your CE at the end of this webinar. Um, it's really simple. Um, it's a one hour, one CE course today, and we set aside time at the end for Q&A with Dr. Cooch. So if you have any of the questions for the Q&A, please ask. There's a Q&A box at the bottom, and there's also you can ask in the chat. You could ask either way. Um, the Carry Free Cooperative, the girls there are going to monitor that and um, take care of the questions at the end. So please feel free to ask questions throughout. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, so that's down at the bottom. Um, at the end of this course, we'll give you a verification code. And to get your CE certificate, you're going to go to cezoom.com, log into your account, scroll down until you see this course, and you'll see a green verify button right next to the course. It's not going to be there until after this course is finished. So um, if it's not there yet, just give it a minute and, and it will be there. So you'll click that green verify, green verify button, enter the code that was given, and take any mandatory course evaluations for this course. And then allow 72 hours for, um, for us to check analytics and confirm your attendance. And once all those steps are taken, your CE certificate will be located in your CE Zoom account on your dashboard under records and manage CE. So you'll click records, manage CE, and there's your certificate. Um, now I'm gonna turn the time over to Nicole for introductions. Hello, thank you, Sharon, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. We're so excited to have you with us for this Curious Science Update with Dr. Kim Cooch. Dr. Cooch is a retired dentist of 40 years. He's a prolific writer, thought leader, inventor, and researcher in the field of dental caries and minimally invasive dentistry. He acts as a reviewer um, in, of the Journal of the American Dental Association and Com Compendium. Dr. Cooch is the CEO and founder of Dental Alliance Holdings, LLC, manufacturers of the Carry Free System, and is a scientific advisor of dental caries at the prestigious Coise Center. We are so fortunate to have him as our fearless leader. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Cooch. Dr. Cooch she is here. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we get started? Uh, thanks, Nicole. No, that's great. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh... I appreciate that introduction and um, I'm starting my video right now. Uh, I cannot start my video because the host has stopped it. So that would be on you, Sharon. <laughs> um, but thank you, Nicole. There we go. Hello, everybody, and good morning from Albany, Oregon. Uh, good morning if you're on the West Coast, and uh, I guess it would appropriately would be good afternoon if you are on the East Coast. Um, we haven't done a, we just realized that we hadn't done a science, uh, carry science update uh, for two years. And so we had a lot of you request that. And so we thought, well, let's get going with that and kind of get that done for everybody. So. With that aside, uh, I'd like to start today's presentation. Uh, there's been some, um, I wouldn't say earth-shaking science in, in the world of dental caries in the last two years, but there certainly have been some very interesting uh, new uh, discoveries from some, some of the scientific studies. And then the other thing I wanna share with you is um, that we're gonna talk about today too is, is restoring you know, these lesions and you know when and where to restore and when to stop. Cause that, that's kind of a, uh, a, a changing landscape, and I just want you to be aware of that. Obviously, as Nicole discussed, I was the founder and um, CEO of, of Dental Alliance Holdings. We manufacture the Carry Free system. Uh, this is my personal disclosure. Uh, if you're interested more about Carry Free, you can go to the website. At the website, you can get a free copy of my brand new book uh, titled Why Me, which is for your patients, for them to really discover kind of a self discovery workbook to figure out, you know, why they have dental caries or you can call the company or you can respond to an email. Uh, so that covers that. You know, my backstory here is, um, it's been over 20 years ago that uh, I had been in practice a little over 30 years and really, or I'm sorry, 20 years, uh, and really got to the point where I felt like I didn't, 
understand the disease, you know, of dental caries well enough. And so I really immersed myself in that and, and made some very important contacts and friends and mentors and uh, came to understand, I think, the foundation of my work on uh, Philip Marsh's research dating back to even the 1980s and around pH and how that influences um, dental caries and, and the risk for dental caries. And then, of course, Doug Young on uh, the picture there has become one of my best friends in the last 20 years. And he and I have done a lot of work together in dental caries. And Bob Bowers and I started this company. Um, we started the foundational work on this company back in 2000. One concept I want to introduce you to here is uh, P4 medicine, and this was first um, brought about, uh, introduced by Dr. Leroy Hood in 2010, and his point in P4 medicine was that um, now with the technology that we have, we can look at uh, approach illnesses and health in patients uh, all the way down to like a molecular level, and at that point, we should be able to get more effective in our um, in medicine and treating the cause of disease and not just treating the symptoms, which is what you know we've really focused on for the last hundred years in healthcare. And his his four P's and the P four medicine is that medicine should now be predictive, it should be preventive, it should be personalized, and it should also be participatory. And as I'm reading this, I'm looking at it thinking like, well, that's that describes caries risk management completely, because what we're trying to do with dental caries is be predictive, and we've always tried to be preventive, but we're trying to personalize the care through caries risk management, looking at their risk factors, and then also, you know, part of it is participatory. It may require some lifestyle change for some people. So I published this paper uh, back in 2019 about P4 medicine and, and really looking at dental caries and uh, dentistry through that lens and how that applies to what we're doing and how we really need to monitor risk factors. The um, the world of dental caries came out with a new definition of dental caries uh, in 2020 and it hasn't changed a lot but the, the uh, the key there that you're going to see that's really changed is that it's now described as a non-communicable disease. So we've always uh, described dental caries as a biofilm mediated, diet modulated, multifactorial, um, but now non-communicable dynamic disease rolling in, resulting in net mineral loss of the dental hard tissues. The distinction there on non-communicable, we know that this disease is transmissible from mother or primary caregiver to child. So that science is, is well-established and, and really not up for debate. The, the biofilm is transmissible from mother or primary caregiver to child. We have a tremendous amount of research on that. But the disease itself is, and there's been a huge debate on this within the dental caries community, but it's not a typical or classic communicable disease. I'm not gonna sit next to you. You're not gonna sneeze. I'm not gonna catch dental caries from you, right? It's not um, a classic disease in that standpoint. And then also this was just brought up in 2020. Um, Again, another definition for dental caries, and it's a biofilm mediated sugar driven multifactorial dynamic disease that results in the basic demineralization and remineralization of dental hard tissues. Um, and I think, as I think about diet modulated, um, not only is it sugar driven, but really the frequency of eating, and you'll see that in a couple of the studies, is as influential as a carries risk as the sugar or the amount of sugar itself. So it isn't just the sugar. And then if we go back to Philip Marsh's work, it's not really the sugar that's driving this, but actually the pH. So this is really a pH driven disease. And um, so I really want to help, you know, kind of help you get your brain around that. So as we talk about dental caries today and caries risk management, I've kind of broken the presentation up into looking at caries risk factors and caries protective factors. And then the last thing that I want to talk about today for a little bit, because this is getting, I think, um, more and more challenging for us as clinicians is when do you restore, you know, and when do you stop? Like when you're, you know, 
doing your cavity preparation and your caries removal surgically, at what point do you stop? Because again, there's a lot of conflicting science is coming out. And um, gosh, I was on, on the phone several times with John Coyson last month getting prepared for the symposium uh, that's coming up this week about the confusion around, you know, where do we stop on that restoration? And um, we're gonna talk about that today. So I think you'll find that interesting. And then uh, this paper was published in 2021. And this was uh, Nigel Pitts, uh, somebody I've known for a very long time from the UK. And really looking at, they have this um, policy for creating a cavity, dental cavity free future in the UK. And one of the things that they propose that's most you know, foundational is to be able to stop that disease process before we have to restore it. And so what we really need to do that is we have to monitor caries risk factors on every patient. And the way you do that is with a caries risk form, um, a standardized form, and you do it on every patient at least once a year and you discuss the risk factors with them as that's appropriate. And that really becomes an integral part of the caries risk management or our approach to P4 dentistry. Uh, if we look at dental caries worldwide, it's still the number one disease in the world. It's number one in every country in the world. It's number one in every demographic, whether it's age or socioeconomic. Um, you know, we're the number one disease in the world. And even uh, just dental caries in primary teeth is the seventh most prominent disease in the world. And so we haven't really... Um, solve this issue, I think globally, or even here within you know, the United States within our own profession here. But when we look at that, um, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis, you know, globally looking at children and found that, you know, with the larger the sample size and depending upon the year of the study, dental caries increased in primary teeth. And we saw a slight decrease for the first time uh, in this data from 95 to 2019 in the dental caries in uh, permanent teeth in children. But I would tell you, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very small uh, decrease in permanent teeth. But so we know that in primary teeth, we continue to see a, a growing um, disease epidemic uh, globally. And I know that you all see that uh, in your practices in children as well. This was, a uh, again, a, a systematic review based on the scientific literature looking at the Middle East countries and North Africa. And again, looking at the children and what they, what they found uh, in the basis of these multiple studies was that as the patients or as the children got older, um, as they had uh, mothers with low maternal education, low overall socioeconomic status, decreased frequency of toothbrushing, um, low parental involvement in the children, poor oral habits and infant feeding practices, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit too uh, in another study. And then also sugar consumption were among the most prevalent uh, risk factors uh, in the studies that they reviewed. So again, those are kind of risk factors that we, we've seen uh, and we continue to see. So one of the challenges is, um, and, and I found you know one of the greatest challenges back when I started doing caries risk assessment in my practice was um, it was time consuming and it was confusing. And we know that we have a lot of risk factors, but I, I tried to distill it down. Uh, if we can do pattern recognition, if you can diagnose the patient at hello, um, it makes it a lot easier for us to direct our conversation as we're trying to help the patient discover and we're trying to discover what their real risks are for dental caries. So I published this paper back in 2014. Um, and what I saw over you know, 14 years of my practice was that dental caries regularly came, came into my office in frequently in these real typical patterns. Like they either had a salivary issue or they had a dry mouth or they had a dietary issue or they had a, a plaque load and a home care issue or maybe it was a combination of some of those. Uh, now we also know that, that genetics uh, influences dental caries. We know exactly to the degree at the moment what that data is like, but at the end of the day, this is really a disease of pH. So I termed these the, the usual suspects after the movie and based on surveys of our own patients, uh, over 12,000 data points now, uh, the number one self-reported risk factor uh, amongst this patient base was 63% of the patients identified that they had a dry mouth at some time during the day or night. 55% of the patients identified that they either ate too much sugar or they ate too frequently. And then we had 
46% of them noticed they had a, a plaque buildup on their teeth. 51% of them had a high bacterial load as diagnosed by ATP. Um, and we know that genetics plays, based on uh, Alex Vieira's work, we know that genetics plays overall in a cross section of our population plays a role of about 9% in terms of our dental caries disease. Um, now on an individual, that could be much higher than that. So, but looking at it at, at a population level, uh, it plays about 9%. And then of course, at the end of the day, it's all about the pH because this is a pH driven disease of demineralization and a dynamic process with remineralization. So what have we learned about saliva in the last couple of years? Well, this was a study that looked at uh, elderly patients that re with and without self-reported dry mouth. One of the things that they discovered in the dry mouth group is they were taking a lot of more medications, which we certainly understand um, the direct relationship between prescription medication use and dry mouth. That's the number one side effect of, all, of most medications. Um, and so it's the most common side effect. So patients who were taking high, had medications for hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, they were significantly had, more frequently had dry mouth. And then we also noticed in the data was that the patients had, you know, those patients had a poorer diet. Uh, they had less vegetable fat in their diet, vitamin E, folate, and they drank less water. And they also had um, less, they used less fluoride and uh, um, omega-3 fatty acids were significantly lower in the dry mouth group as well. So not only are they have dry mouth, but it appears the diet for that group was not as healthy as well. And we talk about diet, we know that if, you know, our patients are eating whole foods, um, you know, the they have a better chance of having a healthier diet and less at risk for dental caries. One of the questions I get asked fairly frequently from young, particularly from young mothers is about breastfeeding. Now, obviously breastfeeding is, um, is what we wanna promote, right? I mean, not only is, is uh, mother's milk, you know, the best thing for an infant, uh, it also, it, besides, aside from the milk and nutrients, you know, they get antibodies and other helpful uh, ingredients, you know, to help them grow and, and, and be healthy. So, you know, we want to encourage breastfeeding. The challenge is where, it, you know, milk does contain lactose, which is a sugar. So it can potentially be cariogenic. But the biggest risk with uh, breastfeeding or um, infant feeding is the frequency. So if you're feeding your you know, your, your child, you know, three, four times a day, maybe once in the middle of the night, I mean, that's okay. But if the child is nursing on demand and nursing eight, 10, 12, 15 times a day, that increases their risk for dental caries even before they, you know, have teeth erupt. So that we see that biofilm of strep mutans in the mouth even before teeth erupt. So, um, Breastfeeding is, we want to encourage that, but we also want to know that, you know, we're not nursing on demand and that also at night that they're not, you know, don't put the child to bed with a bottle and because the frequency is the issue. It's like if you think about you with a, a, a Coke, uh, if you drink the Coke and get it over with. They, they literally sit and drink soda and they just sip it all day long. Same with coffee or same with coffee with sugar sweetener in it as well. So it's really that frequency of doing this that's the real issue. So that's one thing we're gonna to talk to our young mothers about. And then the dietary gardens, it's very, I think important and appropriate for us to discuss diet with our patients. Certainly um, diet's like the second most frequent risk and it may not just be the amount of sugar again, but it may be the frequency and it may be a lot of the processed foods that they're eating as well. So um, again, I think that in this study, this report, and in, in, this was in JADA uh, last year, you know, again, patients that had greater compliance for our healthy dietary guidelines that were at lower risk for developing dental caries. And those dietary guidelines really around eating whole foods. Um, when we talk about recent discoveries in terms of looking at the dental caries biofilm, uh, again, this was a study that was published, a cross-sectional study that came out of Australia looking at Aboriginal children and not surprisingly, 
those children that had higher salivary uh, mutans, streptococci, and lactobacillus counts, once again, uh, were at 51 and 52% more at risk for dental caries than those with lower counts. And they all also noticed that lower toothbrushing frequency and daily soft drink consumption uh, significantly uh, increased their caries experience as well. So those are just reinforcing data that we've already known, but we have more science around that. I included this study. I thought it was really interesting. This came out last year as well. And they were looking at spatial mapping of the biofilm around uh, strep mutans. And it's interesting from the standpoint, it was described as a corona because you have the strep mutans um, colonies within the biofilm. And then you have this corona or this rotund shape of co-aggregators around it. Now, one of the things that's interesting about uh, the biofilm itself, the more that we study it, I think 20 years ago, we looked at, at biofilms as kind of this random, you know, accumulation of, of, of microbes in a, in a mass, right? And it, there's nothing random about it. The more that we learn about and study biofilms, the more that we realize is that there are very specific microbes that are neighbors to other microbes. So the the biofilm itself is very regularly organized in terms of who's there. And so there are different microbes that prefer and um, I guess are more successful um, co-adapting and living next to other, other organisms. And so they broke down and looked at strep mutans and found this unique kind of corona shape around it of those other organisms that may mediate the function and the outcome then of that kind of microbiome. I just thought it was interesting, particularly when the word corona came up because of what we've been through in the last couple of years. But it also just really highlights the point that when you, when you have a patient that has dental caries, they have a cariogenic biofilm and it's not a random thing. I mean, that biofilm, when you look at it, you know, we see regular patterns of organisms and microbes within that. So it just, um, just kind of increases our understanding of that as well. I think we're going to learn more and more about biofilms as time goes by. This was an interesting study. This was published again in, in 2020. And fermented foods, of course, we want to encourage people to eat. We know they're healthy. They're, uh, you know, they're, a lot of them are tend, tend to be probiotic as well. Um, this was a first time that a study that used uh, that looked at Lactobacillus sacchii as one of those uh, fermentation type bacteria and found that there was an association actually between um, that L sacchii and that was present in fermented foods and dental caries risk. So you know some of the foods that we think are really healthy and can't imagine how they might be uh, you know increase our caries risk, we're discovering more about that. I included this study, it's important because I think it has um, application in humans. It was a rat study, but they looked at, uh, they took you know healthy rats, they inoculate them with strep mutans and gave them a cariogenic diet. They added sugar to the diet, obviously. And then they damaged the heart. Uh, and then they went back and looked at the, the heart after it had been damaged and then compared it with uh, the dental caries incidence and then also their sugar intake. And what they found was that the endo-infective, um, the pathogenicity of the infective endocarditis was really correlated strongly to um, their dental caries incidence and also their sugar intake. So I, one of the things that we have to be aware of, I mean, patients, you know, Ask, I mean, we talk about periodontal disease all the time and the oral systemic connection. We need to be aware there's growing evidence that obviously that some of the microbes that play a role in dental caries also end up in the rest of the body and may put us at risk for other diseases as well. Certainly one of those is infective um, uh, bacterial endocarditis. And we also know uh, microbleeds and um, strokes in the brain uh, from strep mutant, that's a risk as well. And then this is, and I, I really found this interesting because I talked to you earlier today about how that, that biofilm, um, that cariogenic biofilm is transmitted from the mother or primary caregiver to the child, to the infant. And we know that, I mean, that's well established. And so they tend to match their, their uh, microbiome film their microbiome from a, a mother and a child that have dental caries, um, their, their biofilms are closely related. 
That's not true. This was done with healthy children. It's not true in healthy children. And the maturation of the oral microbiome in children that are caries free found that it matures and becomes significantly different from their primary caregiver uh, over a period of three to four years. So that at age four years, those healthy children had a biofilm in their mouth on their teeth that was distinctly different from their caregivers. So I just thought that was very interesting that the difference between the biofilm and a, and a child that has severe early childhood dental caries and a healthy child and their mothers. So, or their primary, let's say that of their primary caregivers. When we look at genetics, um, this most recent study was a meta uh, um, genome wide analysis of dental caries and periodontitis as well. And it was a meta analysis, and they found 47 uh, novel and conditionally independent risk loci for dental caries. So that we know that dental caries certainly has genes that um, influence your risk or your patient's risk for it. And then I thought it was interesting here, we, they demonstrated that the heritability of dental caries is enriched for conserved genomic regions and partially overlapping with a range of complex traits that included smoking, education, personality traits, and metabolic measures. So when we think of dental caries, it may overlap with other uh, behaviors and personal, personality traits that are genetic as well. And so I think I found that was quite interesting. This is a study that was published. This is a population-based observational study that came out of South Korea. And they've been doing this for about 20 years, uh, looking at health factors in their population. And then also one of those happens to be dental caries. And this now has 376,000 people uh, in, the, in this population-based study, aged 20 years and older. So this is data being collected by their healthcare system. And uh, they had at least one examination between uh, 2005 and 2008. And what they looked at was body mass index for a period of 10 years and, and watched the changes in it. And, and the conclusion was that it was body mass index was positively associated uh, with an increased incidence of advanced dental caries. And then it was also more prominent yet in an elderly person or a woman. So those were the, the, the key factors coming out of this data. So again, body mass index we know is related to dental caries and appears to even be amplified then in elderly person or women as well. I found this study particularly interesting because when I just had mentioned in the genetics, there was a partial overlap between the dental caries genes uh, in the region of, of smoking genes that you know increased uh, a person's preference for cigarette smoking. In this study, they found that prenatal smoking for the mother, now we know that, that uh, decreases birth weight and uh, preterm um, birth weight and, and premature delivery, uh, but here it increased the caries experience in the child as well, but not only the mother, but the partner. Even if the partner smoked, so this is secondhand smoke, um, so it's not even if the mother didn't smoke and the partner smoked, that increased the risk of dental caries in the child. So I, I just found this is very interesting. It has something beyond just the direct um, inner uterine environment, but also the environment, you know, outside of the body as well. So smoking is bad. Uh, I mean, it has a lot of health risk associated with it. One of those appears to be dental caries for the uh, developing child. This is a study then that looked at type 1 diabetes. And again, uh, type 1 diabetes uh, patients had a significantly higher DMFT score compared to controls. And a meta-analysis proved that type 1 diabetes increases your risk for dental caries risk. And we also know that type 1 di diabetics may have uh, an increased risk for periodontal disease as well. I know that you guys have seen that uh, in your patients. So that kind of goes through the risk factors and kind of gives you an update on that. As we talk about protective factors, I look at pH neutralization uh, based on Philip Marsh's work. Certainly fluoride, we know um, 
helps strengthen the enamel and make it more resistant to demineralization. Uh, sodium hypochlorite is a broad, broad spectrum safe uh, antimicrobial agent to use. And xylitol, I'm going to give you some data on xylitol. Um, and then, of course, nanohydroxyapatite, which we've been using for quite a few years now, uh, again, as a remineralizing um, material. This is a study that was published by um, Peter Breckman and John Featherstone. This was a um, practice-based network research. And their conclusion was that the carry screen um, in, a, in, in the, the practice, dental practice, uh, poorly predicted the carries risk and future clinical outcomes. Now, I don't use it for that, nor do I recommend it for that. However, one interesting point in this paper was that they discovered that it did relate, uh, strongly correlate to the overall uh, bacterial load, uh, which is what I use it for. So it, it, they validated actually why I recommend using the carry screen. Um, and it also correlated for interproximal uh, radiographic lesions and also white spot lesions. So um, while it's not predictive of future outcomes, uh, it certainly is very predictive of, or not, let's not say predictive, but is uh, correlates strongly to their, or is a good measure of their overall bacterial load. And then in this paper that was published um, this last year, they looked at several different caries risk tests and the carry screen was uh, among those. And the carry screen, the conclusion was that the carry screen uh, was highly efficient in assessing the carries risk of patients. Uh, so again, that's, uh, I guess, in conflict with the data of the previous study. And this study, it actually uh, did, uh, uh, was predictive of the patient's carries risk. And they also noted that it was easy to perform and provides the results in a very short time chair side. So if you're looking for a biometric, I, I typically recommend using this for measuring bacterial load. Do they have a biofilm issue? And then that course, then I use that determination on whether or not I'm gonna use an antimicrobial approach uh, to helping treat the patient. Now we talk about perfect protective factors and fluoride, I mean, you know, we spent a lot of time teaching our patients how to brush their teeth, proper technique, and we taught them we may put them in, um, into a mechanical toothbrush of some sort um, or an ultrasonic brush. We spent a lot of time on tooth brushing technique and flossing. We have, we recommend fluoride toothpaste for them. And a lot of times we'll even give them a prescription based 5,000 part per million fluoride gel. But we don't really go into detail on how to use the gel or the toothpaste. And as it turns out, of course, we've known this for quite some time, but that if you take a 5,000 part per million gel and you brush your teeth and you, then you rinse your mouth out with water afterwards, you've now reduced the concentration of the fluoride to something that would have been if they had brushed with an 1,100 part per million fluoride gel and hadn't rinsed their mouth out or just spit it out and not rinse. And if you rinse your mouth out after using a standard 1100 part per million fluoride dentifrice, you've reduced it down to just a couple hundred parts per million. Um, so rinsing your mouth out with water afterwards significantly reduces the amount of fluoride concentration in the mouth. The other thing that I found most interesting in this study is I'm always uh, recommending for patients to just use a small amount, particularly like if you're using the carry-free gel, I tell them just to use a, a pea-sized amount, that's all you need. And technically that's all you need with that as long as you're not rinsing your mouth out with water. The conclusion in this study was that for like standard toothpaste, patients should use two centimeters. And if you stop and think about that, that's almost an, well, you know, an inch is 2.54 centimeters. So we're talking about 80% 80, 80 of an inch, which is about the entire length of your standard um, brush head for a standard, you know, just mechanical toothbrush. So it's one thing we need to advise our patients is use two centimeters use, you know, fill the entire toothbrush. Now, if you are uh, using a 5,000 part per million gel, I don't think that's necessary. But then I also think that it's important for the patient not to rinse with water immediately afterwards, spit out, you know, the gel and then, um, and don't rinse. This was a particularly interesting study. Um, and it's one of, uh, it's one that I particularly enjoyed. This just came out this year. And um, this was a, an in vitro study on biofilms. And this is an I told you so, because I have been criticized uh, in the past for listing xylitol as a protective factor against dental caries. And 
We've got a lot of data on xylitol, particularly chewing gum, and um, they come out of the Scandinavian countries. These studies have been around for you know, for 30 years, looking at the transmission of that biofilm from again from mother to child. Uh, xylitol breaks out. We know that xylitol also reduces the acid production of, of biofilms. So in my mind, this is a protective you know a protective factor, and it's a benefit. This study was quite interesting from the standpoint that they looked at it specifically within the biofilm and the concentration of the xylitol and it had a clear anti-caryogenic effect on strep mutans which was slightly different depending upon the strain and also the concentration of the xylitol at 0.4 grams per milliliter or higher which is essentially 35 percent concentration of xylitol uh, it had a significant effect on reducing the uh, the acid production and the karyogenic activity outcome of that biofilm. At 0.8 uh, grams per milliliter, which is essentially 70% xylitol, uh, it almost completely stopped any acid production, stopped the biofilm and being able to develop the infrastructure of the biofilm. So it stopped the development of the biofilm at 0.8, but at 0.4, it significantly reduced its ability to create the dextrans and mutans that create that biofilm. Now I've got a couple of products in here, I can tell you that I know the carry-free C2X spray is um, has a 35% concentration. I don't know about Spry. I don't know, personally know, and I couldn't find any of the data, but I don't know of another product on the market that has 35% xylitol aside from that. But you will see more products in the future probably from Carry Free uh, that is you know, looking to increase that based on that study. So xylitol has a clear anti-caryogenic effect. Um, this was a study that I found quite interesting because they looked at dextran coated um, nanoparticles of ferric oxide and became under acidic conditions in the mouth when you use them, they use them like in a, um, in a denifers, in an acidic condition, when you had an acidic episode, uh, they became quite reactive, almost like a peroxidase enzyme. Uh, and targeted the, the biofilm with high specificity. And it prevented severe dental caries without surrounding the uh, oral, other oral tissues. And I, the interesting thing about this is, you know, ferric oxide, what is that? It's rust. So rust particles, nanoparticles actually, um, that were dextran coated, uh, the iron oxide, uh, in during acidic episodes was very effective at reducing um, the dental caries risk. So I just thought that was very interesting. I have quite a novel approach. Looking at, um, this was a study that examined on children, looked at um, the use of, actually, I'm sorry, this was um, a, um, an in vitro study, but looking at a 1400 part per million fluoride toothpaste and then comparing it with bioactive glass and also looking at nanoparticle hydroxyapatite. And what their conclusion was, was that the 1400 part per million fluoride toothpaste uh, increased more remineralization um, and they used artificial saliva as part of their design and their study model, which is very important that, that we look at uh, these the design of these in vitro studies. And I think artificial saliva is important or bovine albumin, something that makes it um, more relatable to actually what's happening in vivo. And uh, this conclusion was that the hydroxyapatite uh, toothpaste resulted in less uh, remineralization. I don't know the con concentration on the toothpaste that they used. Uh, obviously that's not the case with a number of other, like five or six other studies that have been done. I get a lot of questions about probiotics and there's not a lot of great data on success of probiotics in treating dental caries or reducing the risk of dental caries. Um, I encourage you to try them, but I also encourage you not to have that be the only uh, strategic or therapeutic approach that you use. The one probiotic that regularly seems to appear in the literature that's successful in reducing the risk for dental caries um, is probiotic milk. And so if you're, yeah, you know, so I would say certainly recommend probiotic milk for your patients. This was an interesting study because found that not only drinking probiotic milk um, every day, and this is in uh, preschool children, 
not only drinking that every day or even just three times a week can modestly prevent new caries, but it also considerably reverse existing carious lesions. So for the first time um, in a study, we see that the probiotic milk not only reduced their carious risk for new cavities, but it also reversed um, some of the carious lesions that were present in the, in the children's mouth. So I think that that's a, an important concept and certainly um, should be something that you recommend. Now, the other question I get again also is prebiotics and things like amino acids like arginine. Why don't you use arginine? And again, due to there just haven't been clinical uh, controlled clinical studies on symbiotics, uh, adding arginine to a probiotic um, and then you know creating a symbiotic. Uh, the evidence is you know is weak at this point in time, and future studies are needed. So again, I think we're going to see development of that, but. Um, at this point in time, we don't have a lot of uh, controlled clinical trials on that. Nano silver, nano silver. This is a very interesting study. Nano silver, silver itself is not antimicrobial or antibacterial, but the silver ion is highly reactive, and so that we know that silver has the potential to help us. And in this study, um, again, they looked at um, using nanoparticles of silver in terms of uh, prevention of. And I hate the word arrest, and can, I think you'll understand that by the time we're done today. But I don't use the word arresting dental caries anymore because I don't believe there is such a thing. Um, and without the adverse effect of dental pigmentation, now you can you can buy a product not in the United States uh, that re kind of competitive to silver diamine fluoride as a varnish uh, that doesn't stain the teeth that just has silver nanoparticles in it. Uh, we don't have anything like this available in the United States, but it's interesting. It doesn't stain teeth. Uh, it'll be interesting to keep an eye on this as we go forward. I think there's certainly a potential there. This is another I told you so. Um, and when I first started working, Doug Young and I and Bob first started working with uh, Philip Mars's work, one of the first things that we looked at was, well, if Phil, and I talked to Phil, and one of the things I first looked at is, well, if pH is the selection pressure for the karyogenic biofilm and the outcome, the metabolic outcome of that biofilm, um, would pH then also be a, a strategy increasing the pH to kind of reverse that and get a healthier behaving biofilm? And of course, you know, we now know that's true. And the one thing that I was challenged on is like, well, if you raise the pH, you're not going to have as good a, a remineralization because it has to be acidic to remineralize with fluoride. And I stopped and was like, yeah, all, all of our studies show that. Uh, okay, this is a chemical reaction. And as you demineralization occurs on hydroxyapatite as you decrease the pH and remineralization occurs as you increase the pH. And again, the higher you increase the pH, the, the greater the, the degree and the speed of the, the remineralization. It's just chemistry, right? So saying that a high pH is going to not going to result in, in enhanced remineralization um, goes against the laws of physics in my mind. Um, and so this was a study I found quite interesting. They used bovine um, salivary albumin to see whether or not that, you know, whether you had an in vitro study where you introduced artificial saliva or, or bovine uh, salivary albumin, would that interfere with remineralization when we we're talking about fluoride and what have you? And what they found was that using sodium hypochlorite actually as a pretreatment to that remineralization increased the remineralization and the and it was related to the pH. And so that shouldn't be a shock. Uh, I've been saying that for 20 years. And uh, now we have a paper that you know, concludes the same thing and, and demonstrates and proves that. So having a high pH increases your remineralization and using sodium hypochlorite by itself was better than sodium hydroxide uh, in terms of remineralization on that tooth surface. So one more reason to use maybe sodium hypochlorite as an antimicrobial fluoride remineralizing type anti-caries rinse. Um, this is a study on a glass ionomer and other adhesives and the bond strength and were they affected by um, silver diamine fluoride. So use silver diamine fluoride, now you go back to restore the tooth. Is that 
dent that's been treated with silver diamine fluoride, is that going to um, affect your bond strength? And I have to tell you, some of the half the study said yes, half the study said no. There's a high degree of variation, and at this point in time, um, we can't really draw a conclusion. Continue to use. I strongly recommend silver diamine fluoride. Uh, continue to use it. I I haven't personally clinically seen any issues in terms of bond strength, uh, but uh, at this point in time, we really don't have a clear answer on that. Whether it's uh, a resin or glass ionomer. Now, this study I included it. This was a review on the use of silver diamine fluoride. I hope that you're all using it. But again, I highlighted this. It's all it quote, it, it's also useful for arresting carious lesions in adults and children. Um, again, I don't want you to think arrest. I want you to think uh, delay, slow down, um, but not arrest, because I think that's a misnomer. In my own personal experience, uh, clinically, you can create a, a rock hard, dark surface, and you will have, you can have uh, active decay progressing underneath that hard surface. So in my mind, that lesion was arrested, uh, was not arrested rather, and uh, I'm gonna show you some more data on that, that uh, use it, but just be, um, I guess, aware of the fact that you may have what appears to be an arrested lesion and you may have progressing, uh, a progressing lesion underneath that in the dent. Um, but I, I recommend it, again, I agree with these authors completely. I recommend it on adults and children who I carry risk, um, have difficulty with their control, uh, progressing curious lesions. I use it to segment my care when I was doing like quadrant dentistry. Um, those who are unable to tolerate invasive treatment, elderly patients, people that, you know, we're just trying to help get through the end stage of life without doing a lot of um, invasive uh, restorative dentistry. Uh, and children, children who are yet, maybe yet can't, um, can't sit in a chair and sit still. Um, this is an alternative, you know, this might be a great alternative for the parents uh, to taking the child to general anesthesia in an operating room to have their dental caries treated uh, if the lesions aren't too extensive. Um, we lost a child, I think it was last week or the week before again in the United States uh, under anesthesia, having uh, restorative dentistry done. So I, I think that that's an, uh, this gives us an alternative and at least something to discuss with the patients. Now, my last topic today, when to restore and when to stop while you're doing your restorative uh, treatment, your, your caries preparation. So, you know, traditionally, you know, what I was taught, of course, I'm old, you know, but what I was taught, we were looking at E1 and E2 lesions um, to diagnose those for restoration, um, the classic board lesion, uh, if you would. Um, then we started you know, recommending that we progress and wait until the lesion is at a D1 or even a D2 stage. And I'm gonna show you some data, it, it, it gets quite muddy. And there's a lot of data that, that's gonna be a little alarming. Uh, this was a paper that again, published by Peter Reckman, Sophie Damagen and John Featherstone. Um, and looking at, you know, when do we restore? And one of the concepts is that we can remineralize these lesions like an E1 and E2 lesion. Certainly you have the opportunity to, to remineralize that. If it's non-cavitated, even if it's a D1 lesion that's non-cavitated, you can remineralize the surface of that enamel and stop the progression of that lesion inside of the tooth per se. Um, so we should take a look at remineralizing some of these lesions on our patients. Now, the question is, who do you do that for? Uh, you're gonna require that, that now we get down to that uh, participatory part of this for the patient. We can personalize and recommend remineralization, but now the patient's gotta like floss at least once every day. They've gotta use a 5,000 part per million gel. You want them to use a fluoride rinse as well. And they need to do maybe some diet modification. So suddenly you've got this participatory part on that patient that they may or may not be successful with. I always like to give patients the benefit of the doubt, but some patients may just say, nah, I'm not interested in that. Um, this was a study that was interesting from the standpoint, and I think in support of that concept, um, and they looked at primary teeth in three to seven year olds, and they did three different, they had three different 
wings in this study. One was conventional dentistry. They did drill and fill dentistry, remove the decay and place the restoration. Uh, number two, they did you know best practice prevention by sealing in the decay. They did some ART, atraumatic restorative technique um, and pit and fissure sealants. And then the third was just dietary and uh, toothbrushing advice, topical fluoride and pit and fissure sealants on, on the permanent teeth. Now, at the end of the study, this was random controlled trial. There was no evidence of an overall difference between the three different approaches. However, you got to look at their criteria for success. And it was the number of episodes of dental pain or dental sepsis. So that was either a toothache or an abscess or both during the follow up period. So they didn't say that the lesions didn't progress. They just said there wasn't any difference whether you did a restoration or a sealant and you know, and those three different approaches of those wings based on the out, if the outcome was uh, dental pain or dental sepsis. Um, so I have, I, I've had a number of pediatric dentists recommend this to me. Um, you can look at uh, using a separator, orthodontic separator, you know, stick it in, you know, floss it in, leave it for a week, come back, and now you can actually look at is that lesion cavitated or not. And this is a very interesting study because uh, they looked at these, you know, two separation, temporary two separation. They looked at 226 lesions, or I'm sorry, 206 lesions. After two separations, 79.6%, you know, basically 80% of the lesions were diagnosed as non cavitated, which means that you don't need to restore them, including 90% of the lesions that were radiographically into the outer half of the, or inner half of the enamel, E2. So 90% of the lesions, radiographic lesions at E2 were non-cavitated. That means we have the opportunity to remineralize them. Once, remember, once they're uh, cavitated, you, you, remineralization is not successful. You have to restore the tooth. And 66%, two thirds of those in, in the D1 lesions were not cavitated. Um, now this is interesting. Logistic regression analysis using E2 and D1 lesions. So we're talking about at the DEJ, those lesions just in or you know, just outside of the DEJ showed no significant association between the lesion depth or the cavitation, cavitation status with the lesion location and the caries risk of the patient. Um, and if you follow this conclusion down, temporary tooth separation is feasible and effective diagnostic aid for the assessment appropriate management of proximal caries lesion. There's a need to reevaluate the use of radiolect radiographic lesion depth as a single determinant because it didn't correlate to their cavitation nor did the caries risk of the patient. So the challenge we've got is we know that 90% of the E2 lesions are not cavitated, or I'm sorry, 80% yeah, of the E2 are not cavitated, two thirds of the D1 lesions are not cavitated, but you don't know which ones those are. And so temporary two separation, get the patient back in a week. But I have to tell you, I'm going through orthodontics right now. That's why I'm lisping a bit today. I'm, I'm, um, I'm doing uh, Invisalign. I'm going back to fix my airway. Um, I'm placing my premolars back uh, with implants. You know, I was an extraction orthodontic case that shouldn't have been done, you know, 40 years ago. So I'm going back through this process right now. And I have to tell you, tooth separation <laughs> hurts. Those things are painful. And I have people, oh, no, no, it doesn't hurt. Really go put one on your tooth and go wear that for a week. It's painful for the first few days. Now, I'm not saying not to use it. I'm just saying be real, realistic from the standpoint that if you use it, understand that that's going to that's gonna be sore for the patient. And then you're going to have to get them back in a week and reanalyze that. It's probably the most accurate way we have to determine whether there's cavitation or not in approximately at this point in time. Uh, this was a study I'm including. It was a 28th follow-up on a single patient, but they looked at not only the IC-DOS, which you guys know the scale on the right from zero to six. We have seven stratifications of both now um, occlusal and interproximal lesions, but also we're starting to look at lesion activity. You know, is the lesion active or not? Uh, is it active and progressing? Because that's another data point that we should have on restoring that. So when do you restore? You know, you've, now you've got a D1 lesion. Um, 
is it cavitated or not? Short of doing temporary tooth se separation, that doesn't correlate to either the radiographic depth or the patient's caries risk. So I would tell you that that's, that's a blurry place to be. And I think we keep doing what we've been doing, keep doing caries risk, um, use your best judgment and document while you're doing it. I'm still, if that patient is a 18 year old graduating from high school has other lesions, I know for sure cavitated. Um, they have high caries risk. Let's say they have a poor home care, poor effective diet, they're headed off to college. I'm probably gonna restore that D1 lesion. I'm, I may even restore an E2 lesion on that kid. Um, and, you know, so it's like, but if that's now a 90 year old patient and I've been watching that D1 lesion for 30 years, I am not restoring it. So, you know, the, I'm still using caries risk in part of my equation, uh, even though this study said it doesn't correlate, it still is short of temporary tooth separation the best until we have some better technology where we know for sure whether it's cavitated or not, um, whether or not to restore. Now, let's, let's muddy the waters just a little further. Um, now that we, this study, looking at bacterial biofilms associated with white spot lesions, white spot lesions that are not cavitated may transverse the enamel and reach the underlying dentin as both active and quote unquote arrested lesions. Uh, in all teeth with early lesions, the pulp showed changes. The pulp on a white spot lesion, the pulp showed changes in response to the very superficial biofilm challenge in non-cavitated active or quote unquote arrested enamel caries lesions. Bacteria traverse the enamel and may establish structural biofilms at the DEJ causing early pulp changes. These new findings may stimulate clinicians to rethink the rationale for treatment methods that are based on the assumption that our bacteria are absent in white spot lesions. I would add to that that are absent at radiographic lesions that are E2 D1 that are not cavitated. So um, this throws another little wrinkle in the works. And I, I would share this with you. I spent a couple of days with Rella Christensen and Provo uh, back in March of this year. Um, Rella and I got into a number of conversations about the term arrested. And one of the things that she's reported repeatedly is that even in quote unquote arrested lesions or white spot lesions, they're finding viable cultural bacteria uh, in the deep in the dentin underlying that and it really points to the chronic slow progression of these lesions, but that the fact that um, they have viable bacteria and that you're seeing pulp changes underneath these non-cavitated lesions, in my mind, the, the term arrested doesn't belong in our, in our lexicon. Um, now you're doing the cavity preparation, when do you stop? We always had the infected dentin, which we would take out, and then we had the affected dentin. Again, based on these studies, we now know that the affected dentin is in fact infected. There are viable bacteria in the affected dentin, which we were bonding and doing our research and our, you know, our doing our restorations and bonding to. Um, the presence of potentially arrested caries does not necessarily mean that the bacterial infection is absent or under control. So again, not to, not to make this confusing for any of us, but at what point do we stop drilling? And again, I would tell you that um, based on our outcomes, and I'll throw this one up here for you, based on outcomes, you're best not to drill all the way to the pulp. And finding clear, unaffected or clean, sound, unaffected dentin is probably overkill, particularly if you risk a pulp exposure or uh, getting too close to the pulp tissue. Uh, we know mechanically that that's an issue. And so in this study, then looking at either um, a very limited uh, removal of dental caries and or taking it down to leathery with a rotary burr down to that leathery af affected dentin le level, um, that they had a greater or a better outcome in terms of needing a root canal. They're, they needed fewer root canals if we took a more conservative approach um, if they had reversible pulpitis. But I wanna tell you that this study, that this was a probability, this is only 12 months long. So somewhere in there, you as a clinician may need to make sound, use your sound clinical judgment. I've gone far enough. I'm still in effect, affected dentin. It may, um, you may want to use a, a 
again, like a glass ionomer type interface to, um, that has fluoride or something in it um, as, a, as a base under your, you know, your resin restorations. But, you know, we, we need more data. The bottom line is we need more data. When to start, when to stop. Uh, it's pretty muddy right at the moment. Use your best judgment and document. And that's about the best thing I can tell you. I'm sorry, I wish I had better data and better technology for you, but that's kind of where we're at today. So I wanted you to know that keep doing what you're doing. Now I'm gonna leave you with this one last thing. This is kind of a, a good news, bad news kind of thing. This was a study that was just, just published and it looked at, um, they were examining, this was done at, uh, at Ohio State back in July of 2020, and they brought in 28 patients um, and they were looking at the aerosol. And interestingly enough, they tried to exclude anybody that had COVID from their study, these 28 patients. 19 of the patients tested, they were asym totally asymptomatic, tested positive for COVID, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, but the, 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 the good news is, Virtually, there was no, even in those patients, no COVID found, virus particles found in the aerosol. So I think that using high volume evacuation and 95 mask, and I, but I would certainly recommend it using an extra oral vacuum, HEPA vacuum as well. The other interesting thing from the study was that 78% of the uh, microbiota found in the aerosol was not from the saliva of the patient. And so that means 22% of it was, but 78% was coming, they believe, from the dental arrogant, the, uh, from our water line. So that's another important thing for us to think about, but it still puts us at risk, you and I, for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis from that chronic exposure every day of that aerosol uh, that we're breathing that has just particles of bacterial protein. So that's my... Uh, presentation for today. I know that we ran to an hour. Um, I hope uh, that we have a few questions I'd love to answer. i am probably created more questions than I answered with that last segment, but I really want you to be aware of what's going on in our research because it's changing our, potentially changing our clinical approach to when we restore and how deep do we restore. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Oh, Kindle, we can't hear you. I don't know why. <laughs> I we thought it was just me. I'm like, no, we can see you though. We can see you, Kendall. We cannot hear you. <laughs> there we go. Now I we can hear you. Uh, oh, you can hear me now? Yep. Oh, okay. Hold on. Can you, Sorry. Can you, can you hear me now? Can you, can you hear me now? <laughs> um, bear with us just a second. Okay, we're on here now. Um, thank you, Kim. So we do have some questions that uh, we wanted to ask and have you respond to. Um, so the first one came in from Kim Seiki, um, and they asked, would it help if you switched with a xylitol water solution to stop caries? Um, I mean, yes, right? Xylitol has some, and of course, it, let's go back here a second. It has to be 35% xylitol. Uh, but why wouldn't you also use one that had a high pH? So not just xylitol, but why not also add, you know, a higher pH? Why not add fluoride or nanohydroxyapatite? I mean, you could use xylitol, um, but I would, I would add other, certainly the other anti-caries um, agents that we're aware of, I would make sure that we were using those as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And a lot of those you went over today. Um, yep. And if there are questions or anybody wants more information on what some of those other um, treatment modalities are, please let us know. Um, we had another question from Linda. She asked, any research on ozone? Um, and then a two-part question, kind of unrelated, but I'll ask it so you can just answer after addressing the first part. Um, she also wanted to know how is sodium hypochlorite used and what is compliance like? Okay, uh, number one, so ozone, great question. There has been quite a bit of research on ozone um, in terms of treating lesions, like most of those have come out of the UK. Uh, I haven't really seen a lot of research on it in terms of treating the overall cause of dental caries using ozone. That's not really practical, but in terms of using it on a lesion, um, yeah, I mean, there's been some work done on that and it appears to be uh, pretty effective um, on those individual, particularly small uh, lesions. Let's say a, 
uh, ICDOS 0, 1, or 2. Um, sodium hypochlorite, how do you use it? Um, well, it's present in the carry-free um, treatment rinse, CTX4 treatment rinse. That's the only sodium hypochlorite um, dental product on the market that I'm aware of. Um, and how do we use it? We use it as a rinse. How it, with compliance is great, but you need to talk to the patient first about it, uh, you know, introduce them to them. Um, if you are uh, wanting them to slots, uh, Jorgen slots, um, adv has advocated for 20 years uh, using self care for the patient for periodontal disease, uh, mixing uh, uh, Clorox bleach with water and rinsing in the shower. I, I did that originally um, when I started working with sodium hypochlorite. And I found my own compliance with that was zero. So uh, if you're going to recommend that, I would say try it yourself first, because uh, I did that once and would never do that again. Um, but again, if you're going to use sodium hypochlorite, why not also uh, have other strategies in with it, uh, making sure that you have a high pH, um, having xylitol, having fluoride, etc. So um, that's how it's used. It's a broad spectrum, safe antimicrobial agent. And in my conclusion, it's uh, um, probably the best and safest one that we have available to us. Great Excellent. question. Um, yes, good question. And then uh, Marissa asked, would probiotic milk help adults as well as children? You know, um, <laughs> that's a great question. It can't hurt them, right? Uh, but I would tell you that most of our, all those studies have been done on children. And most of our fluoride studies have been done on children. And we extrapolate all those studies onto adults. So I don't have, I don't, I don't know of any scientific study, a clinical trial that was conducted on adults using probiotic milk. I don't know of a single one, but extrapolating the science we have from the child, worst case scenario couldn't hurt you, right? So it's like, if you're drinking milk, why not drink probiotic milk? Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the last one we'll address, which was something that you were talking about at the very end, um, Bertha asked, have there been studies on the effects of pulmonary fibrosis and percentage of dental healthcare workers who over time have been diagnosed with the condition? I think this is a really important question to Yeah, address. and Bertha, that's an incredible question. And let me tell you, yes, I first put it on our radar screen. Go to the CDC and educate yourself. Uh, go look it up, do a Google search on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, the first report that came out of this uh, was a cluster uh, uh, they discovered a cluster of infections, um, diagnoses. The CDC discovered it um, in, a, in, in a county in Virginia and found that they all of a sudden had these idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis cases and they were all from dentists and hygienists. And so now they determine that we are 23 times our risk as a dental professional, we're 23 times more likely to contract and die. And, it, and, it, and it's a fatal disease. There's no treatment, average life expectancy from time of diagnosis is five years. I had three colleagues die that now that have died from it that I know uh, personally in the last year. Um, so this is a concern. And when I talk about that, on that last slide, it we don't have to worry about COVID. I mean, you know, you look at the data now, you know, that's not the killer for us. Um, the, the whole bacteria and stuff in the, in the aerosol, it's those fragments of bacterial protein we're creating, either using the ultrasonic or the high-speed handpiece that's in that aerosol. Um, and 99.9% .9 of those aerosol particles are smaller than 0.1 microns. Uh, that was another study I'll, uh, that I'll be talking about later this week at COIS. Um, so we're breathing that all day long, every day. That increases our, we're, you know, we're the number one risk for getting idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's something that we as a profession need to address. We need to talk about, and you need to be aware of, protect yourself. Absolutely. Thank you for, thank you for asking that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kim. <clears throat> Those were important updates. Um, so on behalf of Carrie Free and our team, uh, we want to thank you for attending. Thank you, Dr. Cooch, for a great presentation. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email that will include a link to the recording in the Q&A, um, and we'll follow up on any other questions that we didn't have time to answer today. Um, if you are interested in scheduling a webinar, there will be an opportunity for you to provide some information. Um, so you're welcome to do that to learn more about the carry free products and the risk assessment program that we offer. Um, and then also if you want a why me book, Dr. Cooch talked about that at the very beginning. 
um, please, you can get a copy for free online. Um, let us know via email if you want one. Um, and you can always call us. Our number is 866-928-4445. Um, that information will also be in the email that you guys get. So I think, again, thank you uh, for attending. And I hope everybody has a great day. And great. Sharon, I don't know if you have some wrap-up items still. Yeah, I'll... Really quickly, for those of you who are listening, I did put the verification code in the chat and it's also up on the screen. Um, to verify this course, please go to your CE Zoom account, uh, log in at cezoom.com. You'll find this course on your dashboard and click the green verify button and you'll enter the verification code SCIENCE2021, all lowercase, no spaces, S-C-I-E-N-C-E-2021. You'll enter that right there and then take any mandatory evaluations for this course. And please allow 72 hours for um, them to confirm your attendance and your certificate will be in records under manage CE. And if you have um, any tech support, you can visit support.cezoom.com um, and check out the articles there. And that's all I have for you guys. And again, right, that's science you. 2021, S-C-I-E-N-C-E 2021. Thank you, Sharon. You're and welcome. thank you, team. And thank you, everybody. I hope you all have a great week. Bye-bye. You too. Thanks, Dr. Cooch.